can I say before we get started? Yeah, I'm going to have this worship this morning. We're <clears throat> here to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. I want us right now to forget about the worry, forget about the fear, forget about the things that are, are troubling our minds right now and put it under our feet. Yes. Yeah. That's where it belongs, under our feet. Yeah. Let's worship God. He's the way maker. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus.
Praise the Lord. Praise Romans God. chapter 15, verses 8 through 13 is where we're going to be this morning. Romans chapter 15, verse 8 through 13. <clears throat> Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. And laud all ye people. And laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. Through the power. Yes. Through the power. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for your blessings on your word today, Lord. Your word is already anointed. Yes. We don't have to ask for anointing for your word, but I pray for your anointing on the words that come out of my mouth. Lord, I pray that it would follow everything that you would have us have me to say this morning, Lord, and everything that you would have your people to hear this morning. I pray before we leave here this morning, your people are encouraged by the word of God. I pray before we leave here this morning that your people are not just encouraged, but empowered by the word yes. of God. And we thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do in this house. Yes. Not by might, not by power, but by your spirit yes. in this house this morning. We give you praise. We give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says that Jesus was a minister of the circumcision. In short, that means that Jesus was a minister to the Jewish people. He was a minister to, to those of his people, but it wasn't exclusive to his people. I talked a little bit about that last week, um, and maybe the week before, maybe it was the week before that, but I've talked to you before about that and how G Jesus was preaching to the Jews, and Jesus wanted the Jewish people to come to him, but he also, also allowed the Gentiles, thank God he allowed the Gentiles, thank God he allowed you and me to come to know him and come into the kingdom of God. But he allowed them to come into the kingdom of God. This is what Paul is talking about here. Paul is trying to address a problem in the church. A problem in the church was that there were, there were Jews and Gentiles that weren't getting along. G Gentiles were saying, yes, we can come into this promise. Paul told us so. Jews were saying, no, I don't know about this. This is kind of strange. Because Jewish people have been a part of the promise for so long. And so there was, this, there was this thing that was going on in the church. And it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Now we don't really fight much about Jews and Gentiles, but we fight against the saved and the sinners. And then it's all about our judgment about whether people are saved or not. And we like to judge people based on uh, how they look and what they say and how, how and, and some things we need to do that. Some things we need to have discernment about. But there seems to be this, if we're not careful in the church, there's two sides to this. Sometimes we'll accept anything and sometimes we hardly accept anything. True. People will come into our churches and there's people around us that need the gospel of Jesus Christ and if we're not careful through our character and through the way we treat them we are pushing them aside sometimes we do it unknowingly and sometimes we do it consciously we do it as Christians now when I say we I'm talking about Christians in general in America so Paul's addressing this problem Paul was helping 
helping them to understand that everyone was accepted into the gospel. All those that would believe. Acts 13, 39 says, And by him all, somebody say all. all. By him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 24. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, this, this age of grace that we're coming into, the, the law and the prophets were made to, to foresee what this age of grace that we're coming into now or that we've been in. But when Paul's speaking to them, now it's time for this age of grace to come. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. Somebody say all. all. And upon all, all. All. Them that believe. For there is no difference. For all. Somebody say all. all. Have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, if you didn't understand what Paul was saying there, Paul is saying that we all need Jesus and we're all accepted into his kingdom if we'll just come to him. Amen. Thank God that he accepted me. Amen. Thank God that he accepted you. Amen. John 1, 12 said, but as many as received him, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He didn't make any exclusions there. He said, if you believe on me, I'm going to give you power to become the sons of God. Paul then begins to cite four Old Testament scriptures that point to the fact that God has always planned to bring salvation to everyone. Specifically here in this scripture to the Gentiles. But really what he wanted people to understand that in the kingdom of God there is no first class and second class. In the kingdom of God, we are all accepted into the kingdom if we will believe on him. There is no second class in the kingdom. So let's read verse 10 and 11 again. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. That word laud means to applaud. It's the last part of our word, applaud. It means to give God glory. It means to praise Him. It means to lift Him up. Paul was challenging the Gentiles to praise God on their own. They had seen the Jews do it. Now worship Him for yourself. They have seen an example of worship. And now he's telling them, now I want you to worship. Now I need you to worship. You need to worship God for yourself. We should be an example to those who come in on how to praise the Lord. That's true. You can't let someone praise Him for you. You don't, I've said this before, we don't need to wait for a particular song. We don't need to wait, wait for a message to move us. There is already a reason to praise Him. Amen. He's already done enough yeah. for you that you ought to want to praise the Lord. Amen. If He didn't do anything else but die for you, He's done enough. Amen. We ought to want to praise Him. Amen. He is worthy of all of our praise. I thank God. You know what? I don't know how anybody else feels, but I think in the last few months in this church, we have seen worship happen like never before at Redeeming Grace Church. Right. I've seen people lift hands uh, at a greater number, number and people that were willing to amen at a, at a greater number. I've seen people who are willing to praise the Lord with their mouths at a greater number than ever before at Redeeming Grace Church. Some of those people who I didn't see do that much before are doing that now. Yeah. 
You want to know why we've had some great services lately? It's because when you begin to worship Him, when you begin to praise Him, it has nothing to do with how I preach. It has nothing to do with how the songs are. It has everything to do with whether you're going to praise Him or not. That's right. It has everything to do whether you're going to invite His presence in this place. And when His presence is here, that's going to be a good service. Because God's going to move among His people. When people step foot in this church, they ought to feel the presence of God before they even hit the sanctuary. People are looking, the world is looking for the presence of God. They don't need a counterfeit. They don't need a feel-good message because that, that is only temporary. What people need is the presence of God. Of God, because the presence of God is what transforms. That's right. The presence of God is what changes men and women. The presence of God is what breaks addiction. The presence of God is what makes people lay down things at the altar. The presence of God is what makes people say, "I love you." The presence of God is what makes people love each other and unity to be in the place. The presence of God is here in this place this morning. Preach it. Why? Because the praises of God have gone forth. Yeah. And when the praises of God go forth, it gets the attention of God. That's right. If God inhabits the praises of his people, then we ought to invite the power of God through our praises. That's right. Verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of God. The Holy Ghost. The God of peace gives us joy. The God of peace gives us peace and hope. The God of hope gives us power. But it's all through the power of the Holy Ghost. The first thing it says the God of hope gives us is joy. And joy, I know some of you probably, especially those who've been here on Wednesday nights for a while, you probably get tired of hearing this, but I need to explain this to other everyone that's in here. Joy is not based and is not determined on our outward circumstances. Right. That's right. Our joy is determined on by who resides in us. Right. Not what happens outside of us. Acts 13, 52 says, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of the coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. And the disciples, listen to this, they've been cast out, they've been rejected, they've been persecuted, they had, to, they had to wipe the dust off their feet because they didn't want to carry any of that with them. And then it says the next verse in Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because they understood whatever happens around me, whatever goes wrong around me, I still got Jesus. Amen. Whatever happens around me, whatever you might do to me, whatever persecution I might have to go through, I'm still, I still got Jesus. Amen. And because of that, I still have joy. Amen. I still have joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I don't have time to be discouraged this morning. I have the joy of the Holy Ghost. Amen. John 1, 12. I'm sorry, I'm wrong spot. Acts 16. 25 and 26. And at midnight, see Paul and Silas had been thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. They had been thrown in jail. It says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Why? Because they chose to have joy in the midst of the circumstances. Amen. Why? Because the chains don't give them joy. The, right. ch the chains don't determine their joy. The dungeon didn't determine their joy. 
The circumstances didn't determine their joy. The, 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 the guard outside the cell didn't determine their joy. Regardless of what they said to them. The other prisoners around them, regardless of what mood they were in, didn't determine their joy. What determined their joy was what was inside of them. The Holy Ghost hadn't left them. Jesus hadn't left them. I still have joy in the Lord today because I have Jesus. Jim Hamill, some of you might not recognize that name, but some of you may when I tell you that he was, a, he was one of the lead singers for the Kingsman Quartet for a long time. <clears throat> this morning, I don't know why, I just decided that I was going to listen to the Kingsman Quartet. Reminds me when I was young. My mom and dad used to, we used to bump that Kingsman <laughs> as we're riding down the street. Of course, I, was, I turned the face up. Well, that sounds good. Some of the gospel face, man, they're like, praise the Lord. But as I turned that on, I just turned on shuffle on YouTube and just was listening to songs. And one of the things that came up was a tribute to him, and he said these words. He was talking to them about how we need to look forward. We need to have joy about what's coming ahead. And he said these words. If you think you have to go around all the time with a long face, you don't have religion, you have indigestion. <laughs> How many churches you've been to where people just feel like they got to be sad all the time? God wouldn't want us to be sad. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to have joy. One of the reasons why we need to have joy because there's enough mean faces out in the world today. They need some hope. They need to see there's some joy in the people of God. And if we're not careful, we'll let circumstances. I told you I wasn't going to go there today. But we'll let circumstances outside of us start to put a look on our face and they'll look at us and say, you're not much different than the world. But I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what happens in this world. I've got Jesus. And because I have Jesus, I have Jesus. Now I know there's going to be some people in here that say, hey, but you don't understand how I feel. This is terrible what's going on. I get it. I understand it. Trust me. I don't like it either, but I know that's not where I get my joy from. Right. Joy is usually best experienced in the hard times. That's right. The things of this world should not steal your joy. Your family and your friends should not steal your joy. Your enemies should not steal your joy. Circumstances in our lives should not steal our joy. Right. David was excited. He went to he went to see what was going on. His daddy said, his daddy said, here, bring this bread and some cheese to your brothers. But he went on up there and he's like, what's going on? He saw everybody gathered. He's like, what's going on? I need to know what's going on. And his brothers were basically like, you need to get out of here. Just leave us alone. Just leave us alone. Because in the midst of all their despair, what are we going to do? They're trying to fight Goliath. We're going to beat Goliath. David was excited about it. Right. To the point where Saul was willing to give him his armor. That's right. Saul said, I'll give you my armor. And he says, look, this stuff don't fit. I got, I got, I got, I got my slingshot. And I'll go get some stones. <laughs> Are you insane? No, I just know who my Lord is. Yeah. I just know if God called me to do this, he's going to deliver me. Yeah. Come on. And David went with joy. Yeah. Hallelujah. Right. And he slew the giants in his life. What would happen if you would face the giants in your life with joy? Yeah. What would happen if you walked in the power that the Holy Ghost had given you and the power to have joy in your life? What would happen? You're not going to change anything by walking around sad all the time. But you might change some things by being happy about who God is. And you might encourage yourself in the Lord, David. You might, there might be a time where you need to encourage yourself in the Lord to fight the good fight for Jesus Christ. Amen. Our joy comes from within. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The scripture goes on in verse 13. It tells us that the God of hope fills you with all joy and peace in believing. Verse 12, right before that, told us that Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, he that rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. If you truly trust him, then we'll have peace. That's right. Yeah. Amen. I know that's a tough word for some of you. Because you'd rather worry about it. 
You'd rather worry about everything that's going on in your life. But if we really trusted God, we would have peace. Yes. If you ever feel like your peace is lost, then look at what you're trusting in. Right. Help me, Lord. I want to go somewhere else there, but I'm not. Our peace is gone when we get our eyes off the Prince of Peace. Yes. The peace of God does not come from the outside. It comes from the inside, just like the joy does. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's going to guard your heart and your mind. Amen. The peace of God will do that if we allow his peace to reign in our lives. The peace of God will, he says, it passes understanding. The peace of God will blow your mind. Because we can still feel peace even when everything around us says we should. That's right. The world right now needs to see that peace in the church. Yes. The world needs to see the joy of the Lord. But they also need to see the peace of God yes. in the church. Church, it's not all about us. God put us on this earth so that we would serve him, that we would worship him. But he also put us on this earth so we would reach other people. Yeah. And when we get so caught up in our own circumstances, you're right where the devil wants you to be. That's right. Because where he wants you to be is to be so worried about what's going on in your life that you're not being an impact on people around you. Right? That's right. Those people need to see the peace of God. They need to see that whatever storm you're going through, you have peace about it. They need to see when they come to ask you questions about things or are worried to death about situations that affect all of you that you can smile and say, hey, God's under control. I, I don't have a worry in the world. God's under control. Are you telling me to fake that? No, I'm not telling you to fake it. I'm telling you to get so close to God that you're telling the truth when you say it. Yes. That you'll get so close to God that you'll have so much peace in you that you can say it with confidence Amen. and know that God's in control. Yes. Yes. That's right. It doesn't make sense. But that's the point. Where does our peace come from? Our peace comes from the power. Yeah. The power of the Holy Ghost brings peace. Doesn't make sense, but that's the point. We need power to have peace. We need power over the things of this world. We need power over the things that come against our peace. We need power over the enemy that will try to disrupt our minds. We need the power of God in our lives. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have... Let, let, me, let me read that again. In the world you shall... In the world... You shall, Jesus said, I promise you, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Yeah, that's right. But be of good cheer. That's right. I have overcome yes. the world. Yes. I have overcome the world. Jesus said, don't let nothing disrupt your peace. Because your peace doesn't come from the world. Your peace comes from me. Yes. And I'm greater than anything that can happen Thank in this you. world. And I can go overcome anything that happens in this world. And by the way, I already have. Yes. I already have. Yes. You keep waiting for God to do something that he's already done. It. Yes. It's already done. Yes, it is. And his will will come to pass. This God of hope. This God of hope, it says that she may give you joy and peace in believing that she may abound in hope. This God of hope is going to make sure that you have hope. One of the greatest things that we have as believers is hope. Yes, we do. Amen. We, the Bible tells us that we would be miserable Without it. Yes. Maybe that's the problem. Uh -huh. that's right. Maybe the reason why some of us are miserable. Maybe the reason why some of people in the world are miserable. Because they don't hold on to the hope of Jesus Christ. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. We serve the God of hope. Yes. 
Yes. John 16, 33 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is in Christ Jesus, or in Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory is in you because Christ Jesus is in you. Yes. We have that hope that one day we're going to glory. We have that hope that one day he's going he's to complete his work in overcoming this world. One day, we, we, we have that hope that one day we're going to be resurrected from this place. Yeah. I preached a funeral this week, and it was an honor to preach that funeral. Yeah. Yeah, but I, Because I preached a funeral of a man who has seen his reward. Yeah. Because he has come to the end of his life, and he has died. And what that death means is he was separated from his body, his spirit, his soul, separated from his body, and he will ever be with the Lord. And one day, that's going to happen to you too, if you know Jesus. We have that hope. And when you hold on to that hope, there's nothing in this world that can take that away. When you hold on to that hope, there's nothing in the world that can destroy your joy. There's nothing in this world that can destroy your peace. Because you know, regardless of what happens now, it's just temporary. But I'm going to a permanent home one day. I'm going to worship around the world. I'll Hallelujah. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Another translation says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Amen. For he who promised is faithful. Yes. The world needs to see people who are full of joy. Yes. The world needs to see people who are full of peace. The world needs to see people who have hope in a world beyond this world. The world needs to be able to see people that are serving God and loving God and still going about their lives regardless of the situations in their life. They are still loving God and still having joy and peace. There are people like none other in 2020, like no other time in the history of this world. In 2020, in America, there are people all around you that are searching for something that will give them some joy and some peace and some hope. And what they need is Christians to be Christians. Yes. What they need is people who are Christ-like to live as Christ Amen. would live. But the scripture tells us in verse 13 that everything that he has given us, the joy, the peace, the hope, it comes through the power of the Holy Ghost. I say we need more joy. I say we need more peace. I say we need to hold on to that hope. But the only way we're going to do that is through the power of the Holy Ghost. The world needs to see the power of God manifested in his people. I believe the, girl, the world needs to see signs and wonders. The world needs to see things happen in the church like never before. It will draw men. It will draw men to see what is going on. But I believe more than anything else, they need to see the joy and the peace and the hope of God displayed in the people of God. If we need joy, we need more joy, then first we need more power. If we need more peace, then first we need more power. If we need more hope, then first we need more power. If the people of God are going to praise God in a way that is going to invite the presence of God, then we need more power. If we need power, then we need the one who gives the power. And that is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Christ, the Bible calls him. The Holy Spirit that comes and resides in his people and lives within his people. If the God of hope is going to fill you with these things, then first we must be filled with the Holy Ghost. What the church needs more 
than anything right now. I say the church, the real church, people who are really saved, people who are really living for God, not the people that call themselves Christians. That's not the church. The church are the people that are really giving their lives to God and are really living for God and are what they need more than anything right now in the times that we're living in and any time you would ever live in on this earth is the power of the Holy Ghost living inside of you and working through you. We need the power of God. Oftentimes what happens is we can get with the joy and the peace and the hope. We get to talking about being filled with the power of the Holy Ghost and we all get scared. Yeah. Not all of us, but some of us do. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> because it's not conventional, right. but it's the Word. That's right. Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do you a power from on high. Yeah. Jesus said, told his disciples to tarry there and you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost and with power. Yes, we're Pentecostal church. We believe when he does that, you will speak in tongues as the Spirit gives up. We believe that when you, do, when, you, when you allow the Spirit of God to fill you, that he is going to fill you gloriously. We use the word baptized. That's probably a better word. Because he'll drench you in the Spirit of God. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to believe the word. That he will fill you completely. Let me tell you, friend, if you're somebody in here that doesn't have joy right now, it doesn't have peace, it doesn't have hope, but you call yourself a Christian, and I'm not telling you you're not a Christian. Hear me when I say this. If you're somebody who desires to have more of that, then the only way you're going to get that is through the power of the Holy Ghost living inside you. Jesus will bring that. Jesus will bring you joy and peace and hope. But when his spirit, Jesus living inside of you, the spirit of God living inside of you, when you allow him to come in and do you with power, that's when you're going to see that joy and that peace and that hope to its fullness in you. The world can't shake you anymore. The world can't change you anymore. You need the power of the Holy Ghost to do that. Now, if you don't want that, you don't have to have it. You don't have to seek for that. You don't have to have it. But I can tell you, I can tell you, your walk with Christ is going to be much better if you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is your typical message. Because most of the time, people are preaching on the Holy Baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're spitting and you're shouting and everything else, trying to get people riled up to do that. But this, we're coming to a time in the church age now where all that, all that stuff. Now you might speak, you might shout, you might do some stuff you never thought you'd do before when you come with the power of God. But what we need more than anything is we need people who understand what they're calling on God for. And understand the power that He gives when He gives that power. And understand the joy and the peace and the power that you might, God might give you the power to, to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That's good too. But more than anything, this world needs some joy. This world needs some peace. This world needs some Would you stand with me this morning?